industrial ecology as a source of competitive advantage, forwarding recycled fashion in America, is presented by Chris Yura, founder and CEO of Sustain You Clothing, a West Virginia-based clothing company that uses recycled fibers while creating U.S. jobs in the textile industry. This lecture is hosted by the Yale Center for Industrial Ecology as part of the Industrial Environmental Management Lecture Series on March 4, 2013. Welcome to the uh, Industrial Environmental Management Lecture Series for 2013. It's nice to have everybody here. For the few of you that don't know me, I'm Reed Lifseth, the Associate Director of the IEM program. And this lecture series, believe it or not, has been going on since 1991. We've been bringing in uh, business leaders of various sorts to come to campus to give uh, a business perspective on issues of the day. And we've had some pretty interesting people, but I think today will be one of our best days. For those of you not familiar with it, the IEM program is a research and teaching unit within the school, and it runs this lecture series. Um, the lecture series is endowed by a small fund in memory of a student who got um, a joint degree here in management and uh, in, um, FES. He was um, a very uh, driven and very sharp guy who went to work for Conrail, the freight carrier, and worked with an organization that I think still exists called the Global Environmental Management Initiative, or GEMI, which was a, a group of uh, US-based multinationals that were trying to um, promote a more progressive stance on environmental issues. Um, when he died a few years later, his co-workers and people from the school and his family established a fund in his memory, and it's dedicated to dialogue among stakeholders. So we're really pleased to have this memorialize him and to have the support for the lecture series. Every year we pick a theme, and this year we decided to look at industrial ecology as a source of competitive advantage in business. And the idea is that industrial ecology, this oddly named field that we're so keen on here at the school, um, produces a lot of interesting ideas and concepts. Life cycle management, industrial symbiosis, materials flow analysis, life cycle assessment, uh, loop closing, sustainable materials management, and the thought was, well, we know why these are interesting environmentally. That's what we do here. We figured that out. But we wanted to kind of um, uh, you know, get on the ground and see how this actually is useful to business, kind of demonstrate that this actually has traction in the real world, thus the talk. So we're starting out with today's talk. And then um, in early April, we're going to have the, the founder and president of Preserve, a company that makes uh, products out of recycled plastic. And we're going to have a webinar with um, Mercedes, the car company, that uh, has routinized the use of life cycle assessment in its production processes. And we've got a couple others up our sleeve. So um, let me turn to our speaker. Chris Yura is the CEO of that company, Sustain You, and he's done some interesting things. He started out getting a bachelor's degree at Notre Dame in, in sociology and computer applications, where he also uh, played on the Notre Dame football field for four years. Um, he has done a variety of things in his work with uh, sustainable apparel, participated in forums at the White House uh, regarding young entrepreneurs and American job growth. He's met with President Obama and Vice President Biden regarding small business issues in the U.S. He's um, been a featured speaker at the, the Clinton School of Public Service and TEDx in Asheville. So um, what we're going to do here is uh, Chris is going to present for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A. And uh, without taking any more of your time, I'm very pleased to introduce Chris Yoder. Appreciate it. Thank you guys for all coming, and thank you, Yale, for hosting me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak with all of you. And, um, you know, I think it's always important, I'm going to just touch on this for a second, is just kind of to reflect on how you got to where you are. Uh, because if 10 years ago somebody told me that I would be here speaking about fashion, I would have thought they were lying, because um, really my, my background has nothing really to do with fashion. Um, you know, I, I grew up in West Virginia. I grew up in a, a small place, and... 
um, you know, growing up, I was always uh, kind of confronted with this idea of um, environmental preservation. We had um, a lot of coal mines, a lot of strip mines. Um, at the same time, I was um, also affected by you know, the fact that we needed jobs, and most of the people who lived near me were working in these mines. And in West Virginia, it's very unique how you know, we can see how our land is being used um, to, to get natural resources at the same time. Um, you know, it, it's poisoning water but at the same time, we need jobs. And uh, growing up with that kind of, I don't know, kind of that, that thought process, I was always very intrigued about uh, this idea of sustainability or environmental preservation and job creation. Um, uh, as was mentioned, I was lucky enough to um, not have cable television when I was a kid, which I think was a good thing. And uh, it forced me to go outside and run a lot, and I was able to uh, get a full scholarship to play football at Notre Dame. And I know a lot of you are thinking that there's no way that guy ever played football at Notre Dame. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I honestly, I, I don't blame you a bit. Um, I don't look at all like a football player now. I was 230 pounds when I played. It's about 60 pounds heavier than my current little frame. Um, I could beat myself up pretty bad right now if I, I went back in time. But uh, from Notre Dame, I, I, uh, I got out of college. And, you know, I really was, I wanted to do something that really, I felt like I had a meaning to my life. I mean, I, I just wanted to do something that, just made a difference. And so I applied to a bunch of nonprofits and you know, I wanted to give my time and, and honestly I couldn't get anybody to let me volunteer for free. Like honestly I couldn't find any of them. And I'm like, I can't even volunteer at this point. What do we you know what's going on? What do I, I thought I had some stuff going for me. I, I guess I didn't. Um, so it happened to be that I got a job, my first job um, was offered to me during this kind of uh, phase of my life where I was searching for meaning uh, to be a personal trainer in Miami, Florida at the Four Seasons Hotel, which is kind of on the opposite end of that, I guess. Um, but I needed the money, I needed a job. So I took this position and um, randomly enough, about two weeks into the job, the Miami Herald, Miami Herald comes in and they need a picture of the new gym. And by this time I had lost a lot off my frame and I was kind of a little more similar to what I look like now. And um, they asked me if I'd be in the picture and I said, yeah, I'll be in the picture. Sure, why not? They're like, all right, well, just wear this tuxedo top, um, hold a tray like this, and a dumbbell in your hand, like really nice and cheesy for everybody to see. And I was like, okay, I'll do that, I guess. I don't know anybody in Miami, so nobody's going to see this picture. It ends up, um, this picture ends up being the, on the front page of the Miami Herald. It's just me and this cheesy little thing. And I'm like, oh, how can anything good come from this? Well, sure enough, I got scouted from Ford Models because of that picture. And I got signed to be a fashion model from it, which is, again, another very strange path in this, this journey. Um, so that's what I did. Um, I signed a contract, and I got into fashion modeling. So I went from West Virginia, Notre Dame football, fashion model. You really couldn't get more different, I think, on this whole thing. Um, so while I was a fashion model, I, I was it's kind of insulting, but kind of cool at the same time. I would be put into uh, meetings where people would talk about sourcing and manufacturing and all these things and very pr pr uh, proprietary things. And they would just assume that you weren't listening or paying attention to them. Because a lot of people probably weren't. Um, but I actually was. I was fascinated by it because um, in Notre Dame, I studied sociology and I, I learned a lot about how we lost a lot of jobs in the textile regions of our country. And I kept thinking to myself, like, there, isn't there a better way to do this? You know, I was hearing about the sourcing from overseas and the fibers they were using. And this is during the time where eco was starting to come into play. And people were starting to make products that were being marketed as more environmentally friendly and way more expensive at the same time. So I started thinking to myself, you know what, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a way we can tie in job creation to this. There's got to be a way we can employ this, these communities. Um, there's got to be a way we can make something that is better. So it kind of set me on this journey. And uh, so two years after research, uh, started the company in June 2009, and so now I'm here today talking to you folks. Um, so when I started Sustain You, this was kind of the compass that I wanted to start the business with because I saw a lot of segmented approaches in apparel. There were companies that were making, um, you know, like 10% organic cotton, but making it in a factory that would be considered a sweatshop and then shipping to the United States and then charging more money. Or there were companies that were making things in America, but they were using um, just conventional materials. They weren't trying to be more sustainable in their fibers. So I wanted to kind of use a more holistic approach to, to making something. Um, so I looked at this as a way to be um, not just something that would be a marketing uh, add-on, but something that would actually be competitive. This would add com um, a competitive value to my product. So um, during that journey, I really felt that we, we were, were stumbling on some areas in which 
um, in the fiber and the manufacturing and the, and the way we present things, we could be uh, a game changer in some ways. And it seems right now is a really great time because in apparel, 70% of people are actually looking for green products, which is really a, a big change uh, into the, in the recent future here. Um, but along with that, there's also this holistic um, desire. So there's people that are not just wanting things that are just eco-friendly, but they're also wanting them to be um, fair labor, which is very important. They're also wanting to be made in the United States. So you're seeing that people are viewing sustainability in apparel more holistically than they were in the past, where it was just, you know, is it organic or is it recycled, the fabric, but not necessarily these other factors. Um, so right now is a really good, a good time for this type of idea. It can be very competitive to have this messaging. If 70% of all consumers are looking for it, if you're making something that's, that, that kind of holds these things to be true, uh, you're growing your marketplace. Um, so the first thing I want to kind of talk about is just fibers. Um, just so you guys know kind of what we're, we're talking about when we talk about t-shirt manufacturing and, and apparel in general. Um, usually water is a big issue with fibers that, that are made for apparel. I mean, cotton is a big uh, consumer of water. It takes around 718 gallons of water to make one t-shirt. And, you know, that's a, a conservative estimate, honestly, because there's so much water that goes into organic or conventional cotton. Uh, the other thing is agrochemicals. Um, obviously, conventional co cotton uh, takes a lot of agrochemicals, but polyester, which is a, a petro, um, you know, it's derived from crude oil, obviously is something that is a staple yarn for most products. And it's used in, um, uh, it's not obviously used in cotton, but it's used just as much as cotton in some, uh, some respects. So uh, those are really the two fabrics that we're talking about when we talk about conventional manufacturing. Um, the other thing that we, we see in conventional manufacturing, just the byproduct of it, is just our massive consumption of fashion. I mean, we used to throw away a ton of fashion, of clothes. Um, you know, we throw away 25 billion pounds of textiles per year. Uh, makes up 5.2% of the landfills, which is crazy to think that. I mean, I know a lot of us think about, okay, well, I have clothes that I don't want to use anymore, so what should I do with them? I guess I'll just throw them away because they have a rip in them or they have a, they're tattered in some way. They can't be reused, so I'm just going to throw them in the garbage. Um, the reality is, is that you can reuse them. They can be uh, used in industrial applications, and that's where a lot of textile recyclers can, um, can use it. So with knowing kind of the scope of what's out there, what, what is out there with T-shirt manufacturing or clothing manufacturing in general, um, when developing Sustain U, we decided that the best thing that we could do for now is focus on 100% 100 recycled fibers. We felt that that had the strongest case for being um, long-term the best solution because if we're looking to develop a closed-loop system, we know that polyester can be recycled back into its virgin state. Um, you know, starting with that, but also knowing that we can use other recycled uh, fibers all in a long um, in conjunction with recycled polyester to make things that are applicable for the marketplace today. So knowing the future, but also knowing what we can do today. 100% recycled was what we felt was the best, best fiber we could really move forward with. And it could give us a competitive advantage as well. Not just be good for the environment, but also be good for manufacturing in the United States. So when I talk about recycled fibers, I, uh, first thing we talk about is recycled polyester. Um, so recycled polyester can save about a half a gallon of gasoline per pound of yarn. Um, as opposed to virgin polyester. Uh, keeps about 27, it can keep about 27 water bottles out of a landfill. That's what the recycled, the RPET uh, can do. So there's a lot of savings environmentally with it. Um, the second fiber we use is recycled cotton. Um, all these are certified by the, uh, the global recycling um, standard for apparel. Uh, recycled cotton is, is something that's used from a, a cutting room floor. Essentially, it's the waste material that gets cut out of a pattern and they collect it at the end of, um, end of the production and it can be reused. Instead of, a, instead of it being discarded and thrown away into a landfill, it can be reused, reinstituted and blended with a recycled polyester to make a new fabric. So um, why use recycled cotton? Well, cotton uses a lot of water to grow it. If we can use something that's already been grown, it, it kind of eliminates us, our need to regrow something. We have the material already available. Um, cotton production, I mean, 40% of cotton can be lost between the harvest and manufacturing. It's a very fragile crop. So those are really the two um, recycled fibers we use when we develop something. And there's a reason why that we decided this is what we should do. And it's because the innovation exists in the United States that doesn't exist anywhere else. So when you talk about uh, what is a competitive advantage for using a recycled fiber, we're talking about people that have invested time, 
and their expertise into learning how to knit these fabrics. Um, knitting is such a crucially important thing, and, and I don't know if you guys have ever felt fabric that just feels like kind of, I don't know, it feels heavy or it feels like bristly. It's because it's not knit correctly or it's not knit to the, to the standard that it could be. Um, recycled fiber is very hard to knit, and if you don't have the expertise in it or the training in it, you, it'll, it'll feel like a Brillo pad. But there's people in our country that uh, once the textile industry left, they decided that they'll uh, invest in this particular um, technology. Actually, I can think of one uh, company in particular we work with that um, they do all the prison uniforms for the state of North, uh, North Carolina. So they have a steady stream of business for inmates. And um, so when, they, uh, when pretty much everybody else shut down in North Carolina, um, they decided that they were going to stick with their, their uh, inmate business, I guess you call it, or the state business, but they needed to diversify themselves because if that contract ran up, they'd be lost. They had one client, one customer, and they needed to diversify what they were making. Um, at that time, there was recycled, these recycled fibers coming out of a, of a uh, spinning mill near, nearby, and they were asking them, can you guys knit this? Are you able to do it? And at first, they weren't able to. It took about eight years for them to get it to feel like a fabric you'd want to wear. And right now, they're the only ones in the world that can make it feel that way. And the demand for it is so high that um, at this point in time, that one facility can't keep up with the, the, the demand globally for the quality of knitting that they have. So that little bit of investment, because there is scarcity, they innovated. And because of that innovation, now they're in super high demand for this 100% recycled um, uh, fabric. So this is one example of a, a competitive advantage that we have, and this, this uh, facility is in our supply chain, so it allows us to um, you know, be very unique in this space because we can use these types of facilities. Um, the other thing that you know, we, we talk about basically developing a more sustainable model for apparel is obviously jobs, job creation. Um, you know, I think, like I mentioned before, a lot of times the apparel market was very segmented when I first got into it with what was more sustainable or what was green. And it really left out the human factor of jobs. And, um, you know, the United States is one of those places that we used to make a lot of clothes. And, um, you know, it's surprising that people really don't know that this used to be the place where we make most of our things. Um, so there's factories sitting there right now. There's a workforce that's sitting there. There's still people that have the skill sets to make clothes, and they're, they're sitting and waiting. Um, you know, right now, we have less than uh, around 2% of our clothes that we wear are actually made in America. Now, contrast that with 1997, where around 40% of the clothes we wore were made in the United States. And that's a huge drop off. I mean, that's an amazingly large drop off in a short amount of time. Um, so the reality is, is that 98% of the clothing is coming from somewhere else. So that's a pretty large market for us to be able to come back into and create some jobs out of. Um, you know, we've lost about a million jobs since, since around the 90s in the apparel industry, and it's five of the top, uh, five of the 15 top declining jobs in the country is, are actually related to the textile industry. So, you know, th when deciding what to do with Sustain U, we wanted to make sure that um, if we were to service the United States apparel market, it would make sense to make things in the United States. Um, the, the United States apparel market is the largest apparel market in the world. So it makes sense for us to make things here. Um, not just because, again, there's definitely a social benefit to all of it. We need to employ these communities because unemployment affects a lot of things, not just people having jobs, but also the crime rate, education, uh, stress on the family. But there's also a competitive advantage to making things in America. People are looking for this now. I mean, people are looking for it in the marketplace. But there's other things that make it very competitive. Um, and it really has to do with the transportation and the, and the production. Now, this is where we become very, very competitive because you know, you can look at the different time frames here, regular apparel manufacturing versus what we do. But the gist of it is, is that it, at the very least, we knock off a year and a half to somebody's forecast. So those fashion companies that are sitting there planning, uh, what do they order uh, for summer next, or summer 2014? Um, we can actually be closer to six months away from the season starting um, to get their forecast. So that eliminates over orders, uh, miss orders because they've ordered something that consumers are not wanting. Um, it also turns things around quicker. So if they have a certain style or a certain silhouette that people want, we can actually produce it in a faster uh, time frame and we can, um, it's a two day ship really from our DC to most, to two thirds of the United States. So we actually very close to that, to restocking them. Cuts down on transportation. 
Um, it saves a lot of money. So, you know, this is where we get really competitive. But it also has the, you know, it's, it's also a more sustainable way to, dis to, to make things. We're cutting down a radius. I mean, really, we can make a t-shirt in about less than 200 miles. Uh, from the, the garment, from the spinning of the fabric to the actually cut and sew of the, of the material. We can, we can cut down tremendously on that bubble, but even within that, we can service the apparel market that's the largest in the world, really within a, most of it within a two-day ship. Um, again, cutting off about a year and a half is amazing uh, for, for any company in, in the apparel industry. Um, you know, when I, we first started working with uh, a couple of our clients we work with now on private labels, they were talking to us about programs that were so far in advance that you know, we were kind of like, you know, if you guys need it sooner, we can do it sooner. And they're like, well, how soon can you do it? And we're like, we can do it in three months. And they're like, wait, you can do this in three months? We're like, yeah, we can make this happen in three months. And they're like, all right, well, let's try it. Let's test it. And sure enough, you know, we've been able to prove that this will work. And we've had customers come back, and they like working with us more because they don't have to plan so far in advance. So again, being domestically uh, based and, and using a domestic uh, production model, not only is it good for creating jobs in America, not only is it good for cutting down on you know, uh, emissions with transportation, but it's also really good for business. It's good for our economy. It's good for a competitive advantage for a business like ourselves. So you know, we, we have a, a, a unique story, I guess, as a company. We have a unique story. We have a unique uh, perspective. And, and within that, we have, to, we have to be able to message our, our sustainable stance correctly. Uh, we also have to stand out in a very crowded space of apparel because right now there's a million clothing companies. We've got to be very different because it's hard to stand out right now unless you're doing something very different. So we have to be very different. Um, and we also have to be, um, we have to use sustainability to our advantage as much as possible. So the ways that we do that. Well, one way is we're very flexible. So as you can see here, it's, it's showing some different labels for neck labels. And what we do is we actually make everything blank. So there's no neck labels in anything we make. That way, um, a company, let's say, we've done a program recently with Ben and & Jerry's. And they wanted to do t-shirts that highlighted their sustainability efforts. And they wanted to co-brand it with a company like ours to kind of leverage the power of two brands doing something good in the industry. Um, because we have, only, we have blank inventory sitting, we can automatically make that happen. And we can turn it around in two weeks. Um, which is unheard of in the apparel industry. For a small clothing company, let's say a, a graphic design person who's catering to a certain market in, um, in Boston, and they make 100 shirts a year, but they want to have their neck labels on the shirts. Well, usually you have to go overseas and you have to commit to 1,000 units to get something made with your neck label and to get it branded your way. Well, we can do it actually with one T-shirt because we, don't, we have a machine that actually can print one label in one shirt. So. It really services a whole vast array of customers. We make ourselves very different, just with, even within apparel. You know, forget about being made in America and 100% recycled, just in apparel, apparel in general. We've decided to make ourselves very unique to tell that story of sustainability, American made, in a different way by being very flexible. So we can work with a variety of brands from small startups to very large uh, corporate co clients. Uh, the second thing is, is that because we've cut down on the transportation distance, because of the price of recycled yarn right now, it's competitive to uh, conventional yarns. We are very affordable. Um, in fact, I was having a discussion earlier, and uh, we were talking some pricing. And really what I've found is that in the past year, the programs that we've priced out versus the Central, Amer Central America, um, uh, even, even some Asian uh, competitors, we've come in very close uh, to the point that you know it's not been you know, we're three dollars over, or you know, we're we're more like either we're a quarter over or we're right on, or some cases we're maybe a little bit below, which is pretty unheard of. Uh, most people think that just because you're American-made, you can't be price competitive, and that's untrue, especially in in the space that we work in. So, in order for us to to succeed as a business, we need to be affordable. We can't be so uh, high priced that only a certain amount of people can actually be engaged with this. We want it to be something that a lot of people can be engaged with and a lot of people can be a part of. So we want to be priced competitively. We also want to be communally focused. And you know, one thing that we want to make sure is we educate people as we're growing our business. So last three years, we've done the One Shirt Clothing Challenge, which is the largest clothing collection um, uh, on college campuses in the country. And what we do is we basically incentivize people to give clothing. 
Um, and there's a couple different ways we do that. This year we're working with Planet Aid. So what they do is they set up the bins, they have uh, they promote it on campus, and the students get a, a check basically for the amount of clothing they they um, they collect. And with that check, it, it's, it's they can, they write it to a nonprofit. So we're incentivizing people to think about clothing a different way. How can I reuse something? How can I give something back instead of just um, you know everybody has clothing and it seems that everybody has a bag or two to give to somebody. So um, this is a unique way to kind of engage people and get them. Uh, you know, get them interested in these topics and also to introduce them to our brand. So, you know, we feel that as we grow as a company, we need to be communally focused as we grow. The other way that we want to grow is we want to grow with um, this idea of sharing sustainability, sharing the story, sharing our market, uh, or sharing this story with our market. And um, in about two weeks, we'll, we'll launch a new initiative, which is basically we're, we're switching our company into a more of a consumer-facing brand, which is something we've never done before. Usually we work as a private label, um, printing, you know, customized uh, you know, apparel company, and we're switching it to be a stronger brand, to have a stronger brand presence. And with that, what we're going to do is basically, um, every time you buy something from Sustain U, you actually are able to share something with somebody you know. So it's all free shipping, too. So you, lo you log on, you buy something from our site, you get a shareable garment, which is basically just a, a sharing tee, and you can send it to anybody you know. Um, you know what, it, what it basically does is that we're encouraging people to be generous. We're encouraging people to share this idea of, of what's possible. Um, also, it's, it's a cool way to kind of think within people and think about people within your own community. Because I think a lot of us, you know, at least me personally, you know, I, I want to save the world, but sometimes I forget about my cousin, you know what I mean? Or I forget about my sister. Um, you know, I think it's good for us to sometimes think that the people that we actually see every day and how can we affect them. So this is kind of this idea of, you know, let's touch the people that we know with something that we feel is positive and, and it sends the same message as something that we believe in. So this is the, our consumer-facing side that we'll be launching soon. So again, we want to engage our community uh, correctly. We want to give a unique story that, that, that matches our idea of sustainability in, in the way we produce things. Um, the other thing is, is we want to be able to introduce technology into this. So this is actually really cool. Um, technology in apparel, usually you think about like performance features or you think about like antimicrobial or you know, you, you know, heat or whatever it might be. Well, we've teamed up with a company, actually they went to undergrad in the same school that I went uh, to, and they've developed a 3D avatar system to fit clothes uh, online. So you'd actually be able to try something on before you buy it. It's called MyFit. And in about two weeks, it'll be launching with our new web store. And, and it's really awesome because you get to choose like the avatar that, that basically fits closest to your body type. Eventually, we're going to have it so you can actually upload your avatar to the site. But our measurements and specs for our manufacturing are in the site itself. So you can actually see exactly how it fits your body. And it shows the tension map, which is what's on the far right, of how tight or loose it is on, your, on, your, um, on yourself. So what this does is it adds a whole other level to how you go about with a customer experience. Uh, it, it, it just changes it. And also, it changes the way that we distribute. Because one of the largest problems with selling something online is the returns, especially in clothing. Because people always get stuff. I know that you know, a lot of you guys probably feel the same way. You get something, you're like, I love it in the catalog, but when I put it, it doesn't really fit. So I got to ship it back and ship it. And there's a ton of shipping. I think it's, um, it's some crazy number, the percentage of things that are returned. I, I don't know the exact statistic. I, I did have it, but I don't have it with me. But it's something really insane. So if we can cut down on that shipping, we're actually you know, we're speaking to that same model of we want to be more sustainable as a business. So um, this technology will be available through our business in about two weeks, which is uh, pretty revolutionary as well. So that's how, we, um, you know, that's how we really are positioning ourselves. Um, we want to be a, a thought uh, leader in apparel. We want to be a game changer in apparel. Um, you know, we're almost four years in. June will be four years. Um, and we're really just getting started. I mean, I feel like right now we've, you know, we've gotten to a point in our business where we can scale it to meet the demands of any customer, larger or small. And we've gotten to a point, too, where we really understand the space to the degree that we want to be very different in the space. And um, you know, our, our mode of operation is, is unique. And we want to make sure that we grow our tribe. We want to grow our constituency. We want to make sure that people are understanding uh, that we want to stand for something different. We want this to be a canvas, because that's what really clothing is. It's a very unifying thing. And um, it holds a lot of potential, because it is so unifying. I know that. Um, 
you know, whenever you see somebody with a Yale sweatshirt on, you know, if you're somewhere else, you immediately connect with that person. It's this the apparel has something very unique about it that allows us to do that. So if we back that up with something with a message of of sustainability, a progressive technology, um, reinvestment in our in our infrastructure or in our manufacturing, um, you know, that'd be pretty cool. So you know, we are we are excited for the future. Again, we're just getting started, and um, I'm glad that you guys all came and listened to this lecture. So I'm excited for your questions. Yeah, so right now we've um, successfully developed a uh, 100%, two 100% recycled performance fa fabrics that are like antimicrobial, moisture wicking, um, a 50-50 jersey uh, material, and a 50-50 fleece material. So those are the four staple fabrics we stick within. So um, really tops are what we, we focus on right now. Eventually we're going to get into bottoms. We're going to um, get a little bit more into some of the, some of the different more technical pieces. Uh, but for now, we're sticking with our basics just because we feel that, um, you know, we've, we've really honed in on what we do very well. And it, it's actually a large, um, a lot of people buy, uh, you know, these items. We want to make sure that we stick with what we do very well before we move into something else. We want to make sure that this is where we really focus. So, um, but over the next five years, we'll be working into bottoms to have a full line sheet that will encompass tops, bottoms, and um, really a whole lifestyle brand. You had mentioned organic cotton and hemp. Are those some of the materials that you also use in, in addition to recycled? Do you combine them? And what is uh, the 44% that's not the 56% sourced locally? Like what the material is, the fiber? Oh, um, well, we don't use any organic cotton or hemp material. Uh, oh, I, th I think it was just, uh, just showing this, the apparel market that in the uh, styling sustainability report that came out last year, it kind of listed out the factors that people are looking for in, in new things. So there are people looking for eco fibers and, and hemp and organic cotton probably falls into that. Um, and then 56% 50, of people are looking also for, um, not only is it environmentally friendly, but they also want it to be made in America. Um, that's important to them. So that, that, kind of, that slide kind of represents what people are looking for in conjunction with it being a green or labeled as green. Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, basically, maybe I missed something, but did, is what your company uh, does a, techno a special technology or a technique for actually using, I mean, is it a technology that enables you to recycle uh, fabrics more efficiently and more, you know, have a better result, or is it a technique of weaving? Um, basically, it's, it's just utilizing the technology that currently exists for recycled fibers and putting it into a supply chain that's a domestic supply chain. So we work with partners that have pioneered the development of the yarn itself and the knitting techniques. And then we basically um, work to purchase both of those items and put them into a supply chain that is a local supply chain uh, based in the southern part of the United States. So there's no proprietary um, nature to what we do. So it's, it's available to a lot of people. Um, we're not the only ones who buy it, but we're the only ones who put it into a domestic supply chain right now and also create certain garments out of it. Are I mean, they're not proprietary in terms of we don't have a legal, um, there's not non-compete with them, but right now in the marketplace, we're the only ones buying uh, these, certain, these certain items or selling them. Hi. You mentioned that um, a lot of your sourcing comes from universities, but does it all come from universities or where does it come from? And as you're growing, how do you plan to expand that clothing donations? Oh. That's my first question. Okay. And my second one is your clothes are recycled, but are they recyclable? Yeah. Okay. So the first question, um, the sourcing of our fabric 
It comes from uh, two sources. One is just recycled uh, polyester, recycled plastic bottles, it, and really the same thing, RPED and recycled uh, polyester. Uh, the second thing is recycled cotton and recycled polyester blends. Um, we, we work a lot with universities and colleges in terms of uh, making apparel for internal usages, usage, um, also for a lot of clubs, different green organizations. Um, you know, it's, it's a vital part of our, our business model. It was actually the first um, really customer we felt was to, to engage, that that was our first customer. Um, in terms of can it be recycled, um, recycled polyester has the ability to go back to a virgin state. So that does have a closed loop component to it. And Patagonia has really pioneered that. Uh, recycled blends, they don't. Um, just like any blended fiber, right now we don't have a real strong way to recycle that back into the virgin fiber. Actually, there's there's not there's a couple ways that they're testing, but right now there's not a, a very uh, definitive way to do that. Uh, with that said, you can recycle blended fiber to go into industrial uh, usage. So it's important to understand that a lot of us with the clothing we have on is, is all blended in some way. There's you know, 6% of this or 10% of this. There's not a whole lot of, I and mean, there is definitely, people wearing 100% stuff all the time. Um, so what we wanna do is we wanna focus on uh, with anything we blend that we use zero version growth with it so we're not using any new materials, um, but we're pushing the technology to get to a point where it can be recycled back into uh, virgin fiber. So we're pushing technology by using fabrics that speak to that, speak that language. So on one side, we are using something that can be recycled back into its virgin state. On the other side, we want to get that fabric back into, um, we want to push the technology to get it back into a recyclable garment. So. Um, so I'm Gabriel from FES. Yeah. So I can see uh, that this concept of loop closing has inspired a lot of your decision making. And I'm wondering what other uh, tools or concepts from industrial ecology you're making use of if you're using life cycle assessment to look at really empirically how do these decisions impact the environment? And if so, where in your process, how does that happen? And also, uh, what can, like this is the industrial ecology community, what do you need from us to do things better? Well, I think, you know, anytime there's data out there for us to be able to look at when we're sourcing and looking for alternatives, it's crucially important, you know, because we want to make sure that we're, um, we're, we're looking at alternatives for, um, you know, sourcing a new fabric or blending something different. We want to make sure that it's speaking to that same language that we want our whole brand to think, uh, speak into. So the life cycle assessments, yes, we do look at those. Um, you know, we look, we look at them from, you know, the products we currently use and we currently source. Uh, we also, um, you know, but as we move forward, we want to see more of that. We want to see more, um, you know, how does a, you know, how does a recycled cotton blended sweatshirt, how is it going to perform for five years or whatever it is? I mean, that, that's great stuff for us to take a look at. Um, really, the big picture of our brand, what we want to do is we want to be able to settle in on using the technology to really push, push products more into lasting longer and then creating more closed loops, but also loops that people know are there. Like, you know, the One Shirt campaign, we gave it as an example of a way for students to become engaged in this idea of recycling clothing back into it. So once we create that dialogue and that communication and education, really, we want to be able to create products that really speak into that and then have an industrial application for it as well. Uh, we don't recycle clothing. We use recycled materials to make our clothing. So we need somebody who actually does that side of it as well. So, um, you know, we really want to make sure that we're, we're working together on a lot of those things. And I think there could be a lot of collaboration in terms of what we need for the future and what, what you guys can really bring to the table. How did you go about acquiring or identifying the facilities that you currently use? Um, well, there's a couple criteria that we go by. One is the third party audit, has to be third party, party audited um, for all compliance. And um, it has to be within a certain radius of our knitting facilities. So with that in mind, we work with the uh, North Carolina and South Carolina um, uh, business development to identify different places that we could potentially work. So. Um, then we go and visit the facilities, we meet with the factory owners, and um, we see what their ca ca uh, capabilities are, what their capacities are. Um, and usually what we do is we start them with a certain program and we work them up, and then we see if that, we can scale that program. And if they want to scale too, 
because anybody we bring on in our supply chain has to be um, kind of has the same, have to have the same vision that we do. It has to be like a team, very team oriented uh, relationship where, you know, the more that we can get them, the more that they can hire on, the greater that they can, you know, necessarily grow their, grow their business. Um, but we all have to work together on this and it has to be, um, you know, a give and take on a lot of ends. So that's really how we identify partners. But the first thing is obviously we want them to be doing business the right way. Uh, secondly, we want it to be within a radius in which we can afford to make a product because that's what makes us price competitive is the dis distribution. Um, and then also the ability for them to, um, or I guess the desire for them to grow their business. Chris, I, I have two questions for you. Okay. Um, the first one is, you talked about having this uh, up to a year and a half advantage mm -hmm. in time, but the stuff you showed on the slide, there was only one difference in all the items, and that was uh, one month or three months versus a couple of weeks. I, I'm wondering how that adds up to a year and a half. Oh, well, I'm going to show you The again. second question, while well, you're finding that, uh-oh. There we go again. <laughs> you don't have to show Never me. mind. <laughs> um, is you, you've mentioned a whole bunch of um, aspects of your business that give you uh, a competitive advantage at this point. Uh -huh. But none of them seem to be um, uh, impermeable to copying. Ah. So w where is the sustained competitive advantage? That's where things that, um, that's a very good point. Um, the one slide, there was the production time was 18 months. That was the difference between three months. Sorry, that's, it's kind of small though. If, you, if that was the one thing on the slide, but um, the, you know, the rest of the process is in like sample development. There's not really that big of a difference. Design time, we can't really knock that off. That's more of a, you know, it's an internal thing. But when it comes to actually producing the products, that's where we see the greatest advantage because we don't have to, you know, our fabric is so close. We can knit, we can uh, cut and sew, we can print, distribute pretty fast. Um, and no, that's a very good observation. Nothing that I do, uh, nothing that I do is, is, you know, in a, in the secret box somewhere that nobody could ever touch and never could ever compete with. Um, in fact, I want people to compete with us with, it. because if anybody understands manufacturing or apparel manufacturing, particularly the greater volume we can get, the more factors we can have working, the lower our costs are. Um, and that makes me more competitive. And the way that I stay ahead of everybody else is, um, by investing in new technologies and new ways to engage consumers. Um, so like the, the MyFit uh, generation, the way we message things to consumers and the engagement side of it, that's how I stay ahead of anybody who's trying to kind of come into this space. But I invite people into this space because it actually helps me out in the long run. It helps lower costs on all ends. It helps lower costs in fabric. It helps lower costs in manufacturing, um, higher volumes. So yeah, it's, um, it's one of those things where, yeah, you know, you, usually don't want to have competition, but you know, with 98% of the clothing coming from overseas at this point in time, you know, we could use some help. I and mean, it's definitely nice to have more than you know, just a few factories to choose from. It would be great to have tons of factories to choose from and them running at super high efficiencies that we can you know, even you know, have even greater output for you know, not as much money. So it's definitely, uh, yeah, it's a good point. Thanks. Um, I commend you for your business, but I, I am going to put a plug out for reuse. No offense to collecting textiles for, um, for recycling, but when you donate it to your local uh, thrift shop or Salvation Army Goodwill, they will reuse it. Yeah, that's if what we're we looking did. at. That, that's, what is, that's what the one shirt can. That's what we work with Goodwill. They actually okay. recycle it. In well, a recycling way. is different from reuse. Reuse is that you wear it again as a t-shirt, and recycling is when you take it apart into fibers. Right. Well, the thing is, is that whenever it goes past its life cycle, so when it's tattered or ripped up, Google as much has much I, I do agree with. I just want to make sure that you're using the terms that reuse versus recycling. Okay. Well, yeah. Goodwill will determine if it's going to be reusable Correct. or... Usually uh, about 75% is, is reused, and then you have another 10 to 15% that's recycled, right. and 5% about re is residue. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we, you know, that's what our... You know, I just we, wanted we everybody built. else to understand the clarification. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we wanted people to reuse stuff before we... You know, and obviously, you can't just go to a textile recycler and give a shirt because... But I actually have a question as well. Okay. I was curious what you do for packaging and if your packaging um, also sort of follows the same model that you use for your clothing. Yeah, we try to, to, to the greatest of our ability. Um, you know, right now, we look at every component and see what can we do today and then what can we do in the future. You know, obviously it'd be nice to have 
um, you know, boxes that we could send out that could be brought back to us. Um, but right now it's not as practical uh, for the customers we work with because they have certain compliance regulations in which they're used to dealing with things. But we can push our customers into um, using more sustainable methods for shipping once our volumes grow to even higher, an even higher rate. So it's almost like you can't put the cart before the horse, but at, th at this time we do the best that we can to, to mimic all our other areas with our packaging and our shipping um, that we can with, what we, with, with the controls that we do have. But for our own consumers, then we can use you know the the most sustainable, the more sustainable methods, obviously for our consumers. You know, if we're dealing with somebody else, we obviously are at the, the mercy of a lot of compliance. Hi, I was just Hello. wondering, um, other competitors in this kind of made in America apparel space. I'm most familiar with American Apparel and. You had a chart that said that your price point is lower than theirs. Uh -huh. um, how, I guess, how do you bring your prices lower than, than theirs? And um, I guess, what other advantages do you have except for just price point? Because I'm more familiar with their kind of way of doing things. Yeah, I mean, well, they're vertically integrated. So um, they basically, they own the knitting facilities, the cut and sew, and they also market themselves. Um, but they also are marketed for a premium because it's something that people, they've marketed to a premium um, price, so they can charge a premium for it. Um, they don't do 100% recycled. They do a 50% recycled, 50% organic cotton blend, and then they do a lot of tri-blends, and also 50-50s and 100% cottons. So in fabric, an actual garment, like the actual fabric itself, we're different because we offer something that they don't offer. Um, while we can be priced uh, more competitively, you know, it really has to do with, Again, they're charging a premium price for a premium brand. Um, that's what they, they price themselves as to that level because then people will pay for the American Apparel name. So that's why we can come under the price. How do you respond to criticism that green products or recycled products are um, of less quality than other products? You know, I think it's... Um, it really, ha you have to understand, I guess, what a recycled product is because... Um, like a recycled synthetic, 100% recycled synthetic, the standards and the, um, the testing it goes through, will, it'll match up um, just as good as a virgin polyester would. So I think that, um, let me rephrase my question. Okay. I think that we as students and um, like informed public know that recycled products have the possibility of having the same or better quality, mm -hmm. but maybe the general public don't, don't, don't know that. So are you, how are you informing your customers about the quality you know, the biggest thing for our customers, you know, would be buyers or sourcing agents for other companies is showing them testing results, getting the stuff tested to show them exactly what this, you know, how this uh, performs under the same stress tests that, you know, the virgin uh, fabric does. For the most part, the consumers that are shopping in the stores we're selling to, they, they understand. They want to support recycled, recycling. They want to support green initiatives. So it isn't much of a, as much of a sell to the consumer as it is to the organization. And with the organization, really, the, the matrix that matter are the testing that they do currently with their conventional fabrics. But in terms of the quality and, and um, you know, understanding what, you know, how th this is not a subpar product or whatever it might be, um, you know, it has to do with just really, I think, experiencing it. You know, we do a lot of uh, engagement activities, so we get people to actually wear something, feel it. And, you know, the internal implementations, like I mentioned with college campuses, but that was our first target market. That's really led to people wanting to buy the product because they felt it. They feel that it's, you know, comfortable. They like wearing it. It's a good fit. And so from that, we've gotten a lot of orders from that. So that's kind of how we've, we've really approached how we grow the business model is getting people in the, fr in the product first. Hi. Hi. Um, so following on that and the fact that you said that within two weeks you're going to uh, start a new direct uh, consumer uh, approach, how do you view your, uh, how do you define your target audience? Do you see it as a niche audience that's interested in green products or just general? And also what's the main focus of your branding? I mean, what, uh, what's most important for you guys? Yeah, I think it's a hybrid. It's definitely the, um, you know, the customer base is really the more the millennial generation. Uh, people that care about um, sustainable products, but also care about making things in the United States. So that kind of spans two different um, 
you get some demographics in our country. You know, there's definitely people that just care about made in America, and there's people that really care about green. Um, but there is, is that consumer that it does care about both things and sees it as being, you know, really, it's a, it's a, it could be a more sustainable option to make it domestically, uh, to make things domestically, or to support domestic manufacturing. So. Um, that consumer base really, we're, we're looking at more of the millennial generation, people that are more savvy with technology. Um, but it isn't, a, you know, it isn't that we don't, I mean, it isn't uh, so segmented that we're not working with mass markets in some ways too. So for our brand in particular, we're, we're really focusing on the millennials and, um, and people that kind of understand the, the importance for domestic manufacturing with green products. Um, again, two questions. How much uh, provenance do you have with the, um, the actual fiber? Are you buying fabric? Or are you buying fiber? And how much do you know about where the fiber comes from, particularly on the cotton side, right. not, on, not on the polyester side? And are you profitable? Uh, yes, we are profitable. Yeah, we've been profitable since last year. Uh, so after uh, about three years, we were profitable. Um, how much do we know? Well, that's one thing. We're very picky about what we source. We have to know where it's coming from. And um, actually, the polyester is a little bit, it worries me more than the cotton stuff does, actually, because uh, there's a lot of things flooding into the market in the, in the RPA areas that are made in China. And um, some people are using things that uh, potentially could be not necessarily recycled, but actually made for um, making plastic bottles to actually recycle. So there's a couple things that, yeah, there's a couple, there's some things that you have to be a little bit concerned about. But um, yeah, we, we basically, uh, we have to have a, a third party audit on the facilities that are actually handling uh, any of the materials themselves. We have to know that they are of recycled content. Um, the cotton, usually we have two sources for it. We have one that's in Georgia, which is using, used from domestic mills. Um, the second one is European, uh, Southern Europe, where it's just using from the longer staple cotton fibers that are coming from that area. So we know exactly where it's coming from, and it's very important, obviously, that, that we understand. Well, thank you very much. Thank this you. Excellent. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Okay.